it's like a bolter where you have arbitrary power injustice seems not far behind with the idea being that ethereum would become a dao uh, ethereum was supposed to be a dao human interaction is not not solved i wanted to ask you about this concept of democracy can't i just have everything i want all of the time isn't that <laughs> what a democracy is the last team wishes you good luck and godspeed <laughs> Space Monkeys, blasting off again with Gavin Wood. He's the chief architect of Polkadot, fellowship member, rank six, here again on the program today to talk specifically about governance. Gavin, thank you very, very much for being here and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on again. I think governance is a really broad topic. It covers capital, reputation, nepotism, fortune, birthright, violence. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's something very innate about it. Think about children on a schoolyard. You know, there's this authority maybe on the other end of the playground, but amongst themselves, they're able to come to a consensus. They're able to decide what to do. I suppose it's um, this notion of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Forming a, a coherent group allows you to do, um, do things that you just can't do as, as, a, as a single individual. And mm. oftentimes, you know, there's a, maybe there's an eventual limit, but usually the bigger the group, at least in the early stages, the more, uh, the greater this um, potentiality, the greater this, this um, improvement in what you can do. And I think this is probably, you know, clear even on the playground as, a, as an eight-year-old, hmm. like the games that you can play if you all agree to play the, by the rules. Hmm. And the games can be more interesting. It's like a... Even today, I play cards, two-player games of cards. Not so much fun sure. compared to three-player, four-player, five-player games of cards, right? I eventually, you hit a limit and, you know, maybe there's too many people in the game when you get to, like, nine players or something. But um, And it's certainly true in these early stages. Like, one one-player game of cards, solitaire, that's really not so much fun compared <laughs> to, like, you know, bridge or something. Sure. Game, right? Governance is really just this, uh, you know, taken at its, at its broadest sense it's really just forming a collective that, that abides by um, some rules hmm. now of course there's questions about determining what rules they abide by and enforcing the rules and so forth but in principle it's it's not so very much different from a game of cards where do you think your interest in governance sprang from very difficult to say i barely even remember these days you know what i was thinking of when i was a teenager but hmm. um i certainly liked I, you know, from a very early age, I think I was like eight or nine when I started coding, I was quite interested in like systematics and working out rule systems. Hmm. I made games as a teenager, like, you know, just crappy, but, you know, multiplayer games, paper, colored pens, sort of thing, cards. Eventually I got to the point where I could, uh, with a friend, sort of self-publish like a, a strategy board game where you know the rules were designed and i think i think a lot of it i don't i wouldn't like to say where in particular you know i became interested i think i was always interested to some degree just because i'm interested in you know the world and a big part of the world is people it's like how people interact systems by which people interact how you can design them how computers could intermediate human interaction how they could be used for more than merely a tool to subjugate the world but also could become a, a way of allowing people to interact in a um, new and more uh, mutually beneficial ways between themselves. Right. I can certainly point to, I think, a few a few books. Um, History of Western Philosophy was, mm. was a nice one by Bertrand Russell, and it sort of opened my eyes to um, a lot of the philosophical currents of human interaction over the ages. I remember when I was, uh, I guess I must have been late 20s, around the same time I was making this board game. Hmm. I was thinking quite deeply about governance through the internet, computers, what we would now call, I guess, DAO stuff, but DAO at the level of a, of a nation. I think I wrote, even wrote up some of this stuff. I probably have it oh, like in a file somewhere from, like, you know. 20, 2008, something like this. Um, but it was quite quite an interesting thought experiment. And I guess in, in part, it's also the people that I've 
typically hung around, like mm. some of my old school friends, not least uh, Aaron, who is Foundation Council President, and Al, who is the head of uh, Web3 Research. Mm -hmm. People I went to school with, they're people that I've talked about all this stuff endlessly with, and um, mm. I think they're both people interested in similar things, you know, systematics, um, rule sets, game theory, and so forth. So you were saying you were building a board game in your late 20s? Yeah, I think so. I think it was like I was maybe 28, 29. Okay, this is a game that was published? Uh, Self-published. Okay, <laughs> nice, nice. What was the purpose of the game? The purpose, I mean, the, 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 the situation of the game. Okay. Basically, you had a big field separated out in, in like blocks and grids, in a grid structure. Hmm. You could uh, uh, purchase bits of the field, and they, they came up for, for sale in a random order. And then you could build buildings uh, in the field, kind of build blocks of a city in a field. So the idea was that it was building a city from scratch. Um, it's called Milton Keynes. Um, Milton Keynes is a um, one, is a new city in the UK, built in the sixties, I think, basically on greenfield. So there were a couple of villages around, but almost all of it was was new development, uh, split into grids with like roundabouts at every intersection. So kind of similar to how things are, think how, how the, what the standard is in in, in the US, but like uh, in the UK, it's like everything is super historical. Like yeah, this, right. So there's there's a few of these new cities. So a new, new city plan, right? Mm. But uh, farmers were being a bit piss annoying and like only selling their their land at like you know in random lots um, throughout the game. Huh. And the interesting uh, scoring dynamic was that it was symbiotic. So that this this. Yeah, so similar to how cities really work. Businesses will do better if they are neighboring other businesses, right? Hmm. Building a city that has a block over here and a block over there and a block over here and there's like um, uh, motorways between them isn't nearly as uh, as economically uh, viable as like a city that where it's all like neighboring um, neighboring blocks. Yeah, right, right. The bank employees can go to the sandwich shop. Um, the sandwich shop guys can, I don't know, use the ATM. Like, it, it, it's all very symbiotic. So the scoring mechanism in the game was such that it rewarded players who built next to other players. Mm. Uh, but it also um, rewarded players with the larger buildings um, more than with the smaller buildings. So if they were the same size next to each other, they both got something. Mm -hmm. But if one of them was bigger and the other one was smaller, then the bigger one got more. Gotcha. What what sort of choices could a player make that made things go wrong? Uh, building something too early on. Uh, so suppose you build a initial early on. You have smaller. You don't have access to so much of the land. Uh. So you would maybe um, build small buildings. Hmm. Every building gets some sort of income, generates some income. Mm -hmm. So you maybe build the small buildings, get a little bit of money to be able to build, buy more land, to be able to build bigger buildings. Right. right. Um, but if you build a small building early on, the chances are that other players are going to build bigger buildings around you because they know that by neighboring you, they're going to get some additional income. Gotcha. So then you're going to end up being the owner of a small building, making a very small amount of income, but then all the other players are just like earning off you, which isn't so good, right? That's not going to... That's not going to win you the game. Right, right. <laughs> so maybe, you know, you'll eventually try and find a demolish card so that you can demolish your small building and, yeah, like, yeah. use it to make a big, bigger building. Wow. But it doesn't work if you build next to each other, next to yourself. It only works if you build next to other players. This, That's this so thing. interesting. Do you think we could dig up the rules to this game? Do yeah, they sure. exist? Yeah, There's yeah, somewhere? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. This book was in the history of Western philosophy. Yeah. That's right. What are some themes that ran through that that concerned you about humanity? Some places where we've been that maybe things got a little bit hairy? I mean, it's uh, it didn't deal so much with uh, the 20th century, which I think is probably where um, the most immediately tangible hairiness has been. <laughs> yeah. Um, and most of it was pretty abstract, right? It was like, this guy said this. Um, this guy said that. Hmm. Uh, this guy said this thing, which, if you look, is kind of like what this guy said before him, but slightly different. Yeah, it sort of dealt more with the uh, the broader philosophy and the currents of philosophy running through you know, the last three thousand years. Mm -hmm. A little bit with the personal circumstances and the broader circumstances of society in which the currents arose, mm -hmm. but nothing too um, specific. It gave me some grounding on the on. Uh, the depth of thought that others had done in and around this area. And it also helped me understand a little bit the branches of philosophy and their, uh, what, what has broadly been 
um, proposed within those branches. And if, if, if nothing else, it taught me that there is really no uh, straight answers for very many of the important questions, right. um, which I think is actually quite useful is a little bit relevant for governance because it sort of it sort of implies that yeah, this isn't a solved problem, right? Yeah, right. Like human interaction is not not solved. The best we can do is take a good but difficult to implement idea and mm -hmm. implement it better. Right, the best we can. I think, really, probably. Are there some key elements or building blocks of game theory that you can define for us? I mean, one avenue is... Uh, it's a very simple avenue of, of you have a collective. Mm -hmm. People have an opinion over what should be done in any given circumstance. Mm. But the collective is such that it acts as a whole. Um, how do you aggregate those individual opinions into a collective action? Sure. And this is a, a hard problem. A <laughs> no very doubt, hard problem, yeah. Right? And then it's, it's made, um, you've got some like, properties to this maybe people can leave the collective if they choose maybe mm. they can't maybe they can leave if they pay um mm. maybe they get they if they leave they get paid maybe the, it costs the collective to have a member leave mm. and each of these these circumstances will alter your sort of solution the potential solutions and how how good they are in a country for example it's quite hard to leave a country it's like mm. you have to pack all your stuff up yeah you have to like Convince travel you have to find another country to live in you have yeah. to maybe learn a different language it's yeah. it's, it's it's a non-trivial undertaking mm -hmm. whereas if you sell your share if you're part of a collective in, in that you hold shares in a corporation leaving as a shareholder mm. is quite easy sure sell on the market you buy some other one has to understand the nature of the collective to understand the potential um, um, viability of any given solution. We might automatically sort of presume, oh, that means voting systems. Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean voting systems. That hmm. one can imagine all sorts of other non- um, or only partially democratic systems. Right. Um, and Which is not to say that voting systems are wholly democratic by any stretch either. Obviously, there's like papal model where you've got mm -hmm. a pope. Sure, sure. Or a monarch... Mm -hmm. mo uh, monarchistic model imperial model you've mm -hmm. got like dictatorial model you've got like um you've got a random dictator model where you just every day you just select someone at random this is perfectly democratic right everyone has um on a probabilistic level exactly the same influence over what happens interesting right right but it's still a dictatorial model in that only one one person is responsible for any given decision you kind of hinted in the last time we were together about a competition to create a voting system for what was it, the UK Parliament or something mm, like that? Yeah. What was that all about? So this is uh, going back to, I think, 2008-ish. Okay. Reforming the voting system yes. became a, um, a thing. Mm -hmm. The reason, in part, it became a thing was because, um, while normally a two-party system... Um, briefly, it became a three-party system. The third party, Liberal Democrats, um, managed to score enough of the um, uh, Parliament... Um, that they become, you know, not merely kingmakers um, for a hung parliament, but actually um, they had a substantial, I, know, I think it was like 25, 35, 40. So they actually had a substantial propor uh, portion of the votes. Hmm. And of course, uh, in a first-past-the-post system, it's wildly uh, disproportionate. So while they had, you know, a quarter of all parliamentarians, they had something like a third or even... Uh, even, you know, more uh, of the overall votes of the country. So it was very much in their interest to change the voting system so it's proportionally representative of people's preferred uh, parties. So they would list, like, I would like, want this one first, this one second? So like the that. idea, uh, at its basic level, I mean, it depends a lot, <laughs> lots of different uh, means of counting votes, but um, at the basic level you have one preference, um, uh, you count them all up, hmm. and then you assign um, a proportional amount of parliament of representatives. So if you count up, if there's 100 million people in the country and there's 100 seats in parliament, mm -hmm. um, then more or less it's about a million votes per seat. So if as a party you get 10 million votes, you would have 10 seats. This would be proportionally representative. Okay. It still wouldn't be potentially very good because it might be that you have parties where they're everybody's second choice, but um, nobody's first choice. 
Right, yeah. And then it's like, if you don't collect the second choices, you can't adequately utilize that information. Mm -hmm. And so then you end up with systems like, I don't know, approval voting and um, board accounts and all sorts of stuff Mm. um, to try to better introduce this information into the final aggregation. Better introduce the idea that, well, you know, it might be that people don't have a single party that they are 100% behind and yeah. <laughs> with all other parties being 0% behind. Right. <laughs> maybe there's a yeah, combination that they're quite happy with. Sure. Um, the, the idea was to take uh, what the UK had currently been using, which is a first-past-the-post system. Mm-hmm. So basically the UK is split up into constituencies, so regions, yeah. of around 50,000 people each. Mm-hmm. Um, and then each region votes independently, um, such that there is they just count which person gets the the most votes in that region, like an MP or something. Exactly. Yeah. And then that person gets sent to Parliament, and right. they represent that region. Okay. Um, so you can easily have it in in a in a heavily split um, region where someone gets there with thirty percent of the turnout voters, and even less of the actual. Uh, Residents. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> there are some like places in I know, like Northern Ireland where turnout is super low. It's like you know, fifteen thousand, ten thousand people out uh-huh. of like fifty thousand, and they get a whole seat in the parliament. And then, yeah, of of those, maybe forty percent of the, of the voters, yeah, actually uh, uh, command who goes to uh, the ones that voted for the person that goes to parliament. So it's like, mm. uh, it, it's not proportional in any way, mm-hmm. um, and. How much influence you have depends a lot on where you, where, in which constituency you live in. Sure. What the turnout is, what everybody else in that constituency, what parties they like. If you happen to live in a constituency where more than fifty percent of your fellow constituents will will always vote for one particular party, you're absolutely set on one particular party, your vote literally doesn't matter. <laughs> right. It yeah. doesn't matter who you vote for because fifty right. percent, like this guy, is going to to parliament regardless yeah. of yeah. what the other forty nine percent vote. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, right. And there's, I don't know, 10 representatives, and it'll be all 10, <laughs> and they'll go with a 51% party. And it's like, what? It should be five and five, surely. Right, okay. <laughs> but yeah, so the idea was, well, let's, um, let's have a system where we don't break the all system. So this is one of the, one of the key propositions of the thing that I was bringing forward. Hmm. Um, people get weirded out by proportional representation, in part because it's um, they start voting for party rather than person. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, is is I don't know, maybe it's questionable, maybe it's not, but, like, there is, a, there is an argument that in a voting system uh, where we are voting, um, we are delegating our uh, democratic authority to a third party, um, that we should know which third party we are delegating that authority to, like mm. which person is actually going to be representing us. This is this is one of the sort of um, an argument for, um, uh, for for this democratic model. I mm-hmm. should delegate to a person, not to a group. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's strong. Um, so it should support both. Uh, so the proposition was it should support both delegating to person and delegating to party. And secondly, that it should retain, in the case of delegating the person, the constituency model. Hmm. So you still vote within your constituency. Hmm. The key difference with the model is to the current first-past-the-post system. So it retains a constituency model. Um, Members of parliament represent a constituency. Um, It retains the ability for you to vote vote within your constituency for your um, person, uh, who may or may not be affiliated with a party. The key difference is that there's an extra box next to uh, on the on the voting sheet, which yeah. is I don't mind being temporarily moved to another constituency if it helps get the party of the person I'm voting in. So it's like because in the UK, and this this is based around the, the idea that within the the the, the country um, there is freedom of movement, hmm. right? So it doesn't matter. I, I can. I am free to move to move from Lancaster to York if I want to do so. Sure. Nothing. There is nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, it's sort of similar in the in the EU, right? I'm free to move from Belgium to Germany if I so if I desire as an EU citizen. Hmm. 
not one at the moment, but I will be hopefully soon. <laughs> this is a, a basic port part of, of living in a free country, that you are free to move in the country. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then the idea is, well, it do, then in that case, it doesn't make sense to, um, to limit my vote uh, geographically. If I'm free to move, why would my vote be limited to only uh, uh, being used in this constituency? Now, maybe I don't want my vote to be used to vote for someone other than this very particular person. Maybe. But I suspect in a lot of cases, people don't vote for the person, they vote for the party, in which case yeah, they would yeah. check the box. I don't care if my vote is used for this person or someone else from the same party. Okay. Now, what happens is we have this algorithm. <laughs> and what it does is it basically says, right, the algorithm is free to move people temporarily, purely for the purposes of voting, from one constituency to another constituency and vote instead in their election, hmm. right? Their vote gets removed from the constituency that they were notionally and originally, and instead their, their vote is used in this new constituency. Hmm. And what the algorithm is able to do is basically take um, constituencies that are, that have that are the most unanimous and say, right, all of the people who didn't vote for the winner, mm. why would they, and, and have checked the extra box saying they don't mind if their vote's <laughs> moved, why would, they, why would they bother staying there? That's interesting. So what we do is we move them elsewhere, but in order to move them elsewhere, we require the winning party to fill them up with a member of, a, a voter from themselves. So what they do is they move one of their voters from a losing uh constituency, one where they're never going to win. They've only got like 200 people, sure. 200 okay. voters, right? Okay. And they move those voters out, drain that constituency, which they're gonna, never going to win anyway, and instead replace them with the, the voters that no longer want to vote in their winning constituency, sure. okay. right? Yeah. Because they're, they're never going to win either. Right. Um, and so they basically swap it identifies constituencies where basically we, we move people, we swap them over in order to have, broadly speaking, constituencies that are unanimous. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you can't make it perfectly unanimous. Some people don't want to leave. And there will be instances where um, you can't find a pair, a pair, another sort of a paired, um, you can't pair two constituencies because they don't have people um, that would want to swap. Yeah, okay. But in general, you'll be able to find constituencies that do have people that want to swap. With the idea being that as much as you can, uh, the algorithm um, delivers constituencies that are unanimous. And then, because the constitu constituencies are unanimous, um, we end up with a more or less proportional representation. And I can also imagine this... Uh somewhat empowering the voters as well to feel like even if they're in a place where maybe their neighbors wouldn't agree with them politically, yeah. they, they still do have a voice as well. Yeah, their voice, it's just their voice moves to a, another part of the country. Fascinating. Were there any other interesting jobs you found yourself doing in the time before you uh, stumbled into the Ethereum mission? So after university, I went to work in the video games industry. So I In what uh, capacity? Well, I wanted to help make video games. What I ended up doing was help making the um, audio engine part of video games. So basically like a high performance audio system, something that could play sound effects, music, cool. do certain like tricks like um, filters and um, 3D sounds and this kind of thing. The main thing that made it fun was it was a bit of a challenge. At the time, it was 2000 and, uh, late 2005 that I was beginning. For those who can't remember, there was um, three new, well, two new um, consoles on the on the uh, about to be released PlayStation 3 yeah. and Xbox 360. Mm -hmm. um, PlayStation 3 has some crazy hardware, crazy at the time anyway. Yeah. Um, it had this uh, cell processor, which was basically um, a three-way, a three-core processor that had like three regular cores, but then it had like six or seven um, sy symbiotic cores, which could do like uh, crazy fast math operations, but weren't very good at general purpose stuff. Hmm. And so we, um, uh, so I, I, I set about trying to make an audio engine that worked well for the PlayStation 3 with its very exotic hardware, the, the Xbox 360 with its less exotic hardware, and then the PC with its very much not exotic hardware at right. all. Mm -hmm. um, so something that was the same code, but would work in, in all three um, uh, um, environments. And uh, mm. this, was, this was an interesting challenge. No doubt. I got a research paper from it, which uh, 
uh, I was pretty proud of. It was like really nice little research paper. Got accepted to a, an international conference. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to publish it by the owners of the company, and this cemented my desire then to leave the company. Uh, yeah, right. It was an abstract paper. It wasn't going to give away any secrets. And then in the end, they didn't use the code that I wrote. Uh, uh, okay. So it was like, uh, you know, th this was definitely an intellectual endeavor, but not much more. Then I moved into basically freelancing. Um, yeah. So I did, I did basically, I don't know, three months of work every one and a half years or so. And then the rest of the time just did my own projects, like the voting system. Mm -hmm. um, I did a few other random jobs like teach English and, uh, and teach maths and art at like, like a middle school. Sure, uh, cool. And for the maths and art, I taught mostly like fractals. I was very keen on making a, a big um, kind of space simmy game, you know, kind of like uh, in the old... Um, what they call like Star Star Citizen, Privateer, hmm. uh, Eve Online, um, Elite was the original one back in the eighties. Um, I actually went to work for the guy that made Elite. This was like my first and only job out of uh, nine to five kind of job. Okay, out okay. Of university kind of wanted to go help him make the the new version of Elite, and then actually they weren't doing that. But it was something that I wanted to do. And in order to make the game, I decided I need a new, needed a new language. This is a hole that many a programmer has fallen in. It's like, uh, I'm going to yeah. do this project. But first, <laughs> to do that project, I'm going to make a new language. And it's uh -huh, like, yeah, inevitably, yeah. you get like a third of the way through writing the new language. And then you lose, <laughs> lose interest in the project. You lose interest in the language. And it's How like, many new languages have you created in your life, Gav? Uh, a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wrote this new language, but it was actually a really interesting one. It was, uh, um, it was a language workbench which is still a relatively novel concept. There are very many examples of them. But basically, it's a programming environment where you don't program. Normal, in normal programming environments, you program in text, right? So you literally type out a, a reams of text. Mm. I mean, it's symbolic. It's like, but it's, it's all like typewriter text. Mm. Parentheses, like um, alpha numeric numbers, letters, dot, comma, semicolon right sure, it's all yeah. it's all very like you've got the you know when you're writing an email like you have the formatting turned off and yeah. it's just typewriter text yeah 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 um no smile is nothing and um my idea was well let's get rid of let's let's not limit ourselves to just typewriter text hmm. let's instead allow for really rich display and input um, so basically, like if you if you use uh, Microsoft Word, you don't type in typewriter text. Hmm. When you type, it, it's it's like kind of how it will appear when you print it out, right? Yeah, yeah. This was a novelty when it was it was called WYSIWYG. Um, what you see is what you get, ah, right? Okay. It, was a no, it was a novelty in the early nineties. Hmm. Um, if you go, if you go back, wind back to like the mid eighties, people didn't type like this. They they typed in uh, in what we would now what now looks a little bit like Markdown or HTML, they actually typed in kind of lines of just typewriter text without any kind of formatting. And the formatting was introduced as kind of um, like set commands that, that you could read in the text, hmm. a bit like HTML. Why are we always programming in HTML hmm. when we can imagine um, writing code in a proper HTML, like in a proper Microsoft Word style editor, where uh, the code is is displayed in 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 terms that that we want it to be displayed in, hmm. like display a math formula actually in maths, like where the numerator is above the denominator, right? Rather than having it on the, the numerator on the left and then a slash sign and then the denominator on the right. Like, sure. Why should we be forced into seeing it as a typewriter yeah, uh, right. typed out. Mm -hmm. When we publish documents, we actually we, we write the math in the way that it was meant to be written, in the most comprehensible way. Yeah, We can't do that with code. We're, mm. we're forced into this very typewriter straitjacket as though code has to be able to be typed on a typewriter. Right, and you have all this mental overhead where you're trying to translate it, right? Exactly. And eventually, you know, part of becoming a coder is kind of warping your mind so that, mm -hmm. you know, in the uh, like in the Matrix, I don't see the, the text anymore. <laughs> I just see blonde redhead, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, um, I, I, I don't really... As a, as, a, as a seasoned coder, you don't really notice that you're only writing in, in a way that you could write on a typewriter. But as we get more and more um, expressive languages, it becomes increasingly important to be able to format this, uh, to split apart, um, you know, kind of the formatting into something that you're very 
happy with not like a one size fits all lowest common common denominator typewriter style. Mm. So basically this was the project. It was like the ability to create a um what we call a domain specific language but not just the domain sp- uh, so domain specific language is this is the thing I'm this is the kind of thing I want to write. Um this is the domain kind of thing I want to write. Um I will make a language that makes it easier to write that kind of thing. Hmm. So if it's if my domain is let's say um something that is very matrix heavy um so these grids of numbers and you can multiply them with each other and I don't know it's very useful in certain things like certain branches of maths um then that should be dis- like a, it should be possible to write things in kind of math in native kind of matrix math that that um, that there should be a way of developing a uh, developing the base language to have this 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 um, new kind of expressibility that really helps me say what I want to say. If you extend the metaphor a bit, maybe it's like programming slang or a programming accent. Yeah, programming uh, dialect. Yeah, dialect. Exactly. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is this is kind of uh, what I was working on for I don't know a year or so. Gotcha. Uh, maybe two. Oof, it was a long time. What were you doing just before you got rolled into the Ethereum project? I was working on um, legal uh, legal stuff. Um, right. So I had a startup um, with a uh, with a friend, and um, it, it, we were trying to make a, a extension for Microsoft Word, basically, uh-huh. that would understand to some degree legal documents, like contracts, hmm. and that they it would it would help you write contracts, and it would also help you understand contracts. So it would like highlight bits that maybe um, were inconsistent or um, that where, where there was a potential error or uh, where a term wasn't properly defined, this kind of thing. Um, but it would also help you as you're writing out the document, help you, um, maybe you've used a new term, you'd be able to like click a shortcut and it would just insert the term at the top in the dictionary. It turns out legal contracts, I didn't know this at the time, um, well, before I started, but I learned on the job. Um, they're pretty heavily structured documents. They're not a million miles apart from a programming language. Ah. Like they're, they're, they're pretty formal documents. They have a grammar. Um, they have a structure. Hmm. And they don't, although there's uh, many dialects, they don't deviate too far from uh, a base level structure. And it wasn't too difficult to basically determine what the structure was within the plugin and sort of abide by it and help the uh, user um, uh, use, uh, create and understand the document within that structure. Hmm. I think these days it would be uh, pretty much entirely uh, removed with generative AI. I think you would just basically feed the contract in and tell, say, right, <laughs> sure, yeah. add this extra course. Although that said, it may be a little bit... Um... So the, th- the issue I have with generative AI seems to be that it it it's like... It's like a bullshitter, right? It's like someone who's ultra confident and uh, superficially seems to know what they're talking about. Mm. But when you dig into it more than a superficial amount, you mm-hmm. realize it's total nonsense. And this this seems to me, I mean, maybe it's going to be improved over time. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I would expect it to be improved over time. But at the moment, it's it's a little bit dangerous in that regard because if people who can't recognize bullshit start using it, then we're just going to have what we assume to be de um, attack vectors of society kind of re because crappy AI will be speaking through vast amounts of um, not so uh, clever people <laughs> and uh, making them look a lot cleverer than they are, but right. still not clever enough that what they're saying makes sense. <laughs> what? Because there's like this mass behind them because everybody's saying the same thing? I mean, at, what the, you mean? At, at the moment, we assume that when someone says or writes something, uh-huh. if they're saying or writing a lot, and if it va- if it looks like it might make sense, there is a there is a sort of a threshold that they have crossed and they should be listened to. They are at a minimum intellect level to have be able to write something that is grammatically correct and doesn't use all caps and hash and yeah, so yeah. forth. Plus they have dedicated enough of their personal time to writing it. So there's like, there's a ne- there's a natural de-sibling, right, of information <laughs> coming to us if it appears to be coming from a person. Hmm. And so we can give it the time of that. We can have a look at it and see if, it, if, it's, if it's reasonable. Hmm. And... Um, 
the issue is that as AI becomes more prevalent, this uh, natural desibling falls by the wayside. It, mm. It's no longer resilient. It's no longer reliable. Anyone can basically take the output of, of an AI mm -hmm. and suggest that it's what they what they have written and, and think. Yeah. And now we have the problem that we cannot rely merely on an utterance coming from a person uh, that seems to have uh, that seems to be well formed, um, having uh, any amount of intellectual robustness mm. like we actually have to dedicate the effort to reading it through and trying to work out its underlying meaning yeah right and this is the problem we're going to be deluged with novel bullshit <laughs> and that this i think is is the big um the big problem that, that the world is facing no with doubt. generative ai it's mm -hmm. like novel bullshit mm -hmm. it's it's novel because we haven't seen it before and it appears to be legit and yet it's bullshit because if you scratch the surface, you realize that it doesn't make any sense. I don't disagree that AI poses some new problems, though I dislike, I kind of dislike the vibe that all of the established powers of the world uh, are against AI, because it feels like they're mostly against AI, in some sense, challenging the uh, authority of the uh, established narrative. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. Hey, there's a whole conversation there. What will the systems of governance look like when some of the actors are artificial? Mm. So you don't see AI as an existential threat? Like when computers start being able to articulate matter, for instance, and they're making decisions of how to do so, you don't see that as an existential threat? I think there's a lot of existential threats to our existence. But I okay. think the biggest one, I don't see AI as being the one that's on the horizon right now. Gotcha. Uh, I think the one that's on the horizon right now is um, uh, people with no great or no foundational stake in society getting to the point where uh, they can destabilize our current uh, physical environment. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular, um, you know, uh, nuclear weapons and <clears throat> the increasing, uh, the lack of resilience our society seems to have our civilization seems to have for uh, managing the fact that, you know, we are a couple of button clicks away from annihilation. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, and it's like, yeah, you know, we've kind of managed for the last 50 years or so, mm -hmm. um, not not having those buttons be clicked. Right. But so that probability the, is... <laughs> over time, they will get clicked, right? Over yes. a sufficiently long period of time. That's right, that's right. The noise function, which is human action, mm -hmm. um, means that they will get clicked. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to really uh, come up with a better and more resilient system for managing this. And mm. it seems that at the moment we're going in the wrong direction. We're going in the opposite direction. We have, we're increasing the noise function mm. uh, next to those very, very, like, exterminate humanity buttons. <laughs> right. And that's, that's really not so good. So I would say, uh, I'd say this is the, 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 the bigger existential threat at the moment. So I definitely think clever machines will po will be a destabilizing effect hmm. on society, like most uh, groundbreaking tech technology um, is. Um, will they be able to be regulated and managed by the current powers that be? Probably more so than uh, than decentralized technology. Yes, simply mm -hmm. because um, AI is a necessarily centralized technology at the moment. Um, it uh, requires huge amounts of compute power to develop these models, and it's pretty easy to work out where that compute power is and knock on their door if they're doing something wrong. Sure, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, this, um, speaking of AI generating bullshit, you know, there's probably a spectrum. There's going to be a bunch of different AIs, and they're all going to be producing different <laughs> amounts of bullshit, you could say. I think a lot of it has to do with the how much bullshit are fed into the models to train them, right? Mm. This is a risk. Your work is all about establishing this ledger of verifiable truths, things that have actually happened. Yeah. You started on Ethereum. Were you thinking about governance at all when you started to code up Ethereum? Yeah, um, okay. quite a bit. It was it was a conversation Vitalik and I had a, a few times. Okay. With the idea being that Ethereum would become a DAO. 
This was this was the uh, Ethereum was supposed to be a DAO. The Ethereum was eventually going to become a DAO. Like this was oh. um, uh, the the Ethereum Foundation was only meant to exist for as long as we didn't have the DAO. The DAO would be the thing that we delivered once we delivered Ethereum. Okay, it's twenty twenty three. How many years ago was that discussion? Uh, ten years ago. Almost. Okay. Okay. They're coming up to the ten year anniversary. <laughs> okay. So this is this really um, this is something that I was very keen on with with Polkadot, mm-hmm. like delivering this original. Ethereum vision of, of, of the DAO, the yeah. DAO-based uh, blockchain. And I think to some degree that's that's happened. But um, post-launch of Ethereum, it was something that I was very keen on following through with, hmm. mostly because I saw a lot of... Um, I saw an annoying combination, like a, a, a difficult combination of, um, of chaos and uh, authority. Um, forming of, of well, in terms of determining Ethereum's direction, hmm. so we had these like uh, weekly calls where we discussed the protocol, and the calls were open. Anyone could say anything, and at the end of the call, we had this kind of vote. And it's like if if the if it was unanimous, then we kind of assumed that yeah, okay, then it will. It, it was a bit odd because it was like okay, so anyone who turns up can, in principle, vote something down. Mm. And we're not we're not limiting who can turn up. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a bit of an odd governance model. Like, it doesn't seem resilient in any way. Yeah. It's eventually just going to end up underdeveloped. Yeah. Okay. Now, in reality, it was something more akin to a papal model, where there is a pope, and the pope listens to mm. the advisors, to the cardinals, and, and mm-hmm. random people they might happen to wander past in the congregation. But at the end of the day, the Pope makes a decision. And the Pope is benevolent, and they will listen to good points. Of course. And maybe things will change um, if, if, the, if, if the Pope feels that there is a need for it to change. But there is an un, unwritten... I mean, in principle, the Pope is, is, is first among equals, right? In principle, the Pope has no greater power than, uh, than anyone else. Uh-huh. Um, but the reality is that... Uh, uh, Decisions are made by convention by the Pope. <laughs> I felt that that was the model that Ethereum had silently slipped into. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I, I don't feel as a model that was especially resilient, or for that matter, in keeping with the um, the nature of what we were building. And so I uh, I wanted I set out to make a more resilient governance model. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I published something called the Yellow Paper Council, which is a little bit similar to the fellowship, hmm. the Polkadot fellowship, um, which is basically, look, Ethereum can be uh, defined unambiguously by the yellow paper. Um, the yellow paper exists as a LaTeX file. We can propose changes to that LaTeX file, and people can vote on it. The ability to vote on it can be, uh, the ability to have a vote can be, you know, we can work out some condition that can be evaluated by whoever, the, the Ethereum community, the wider community, um, to sort of uh, uh, elevate people into the Yellow Paper Council. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, you know, I, I sort of wrote it out as a, as a basic governance mechanism. Now, it was not going to be on-chain particular. I think, I think I, eventually the idea was that it would become on-chain. Sure. And I think, yeah, that's right. I actually wrote it up as a smart contract on Ethereum um, that the... Uh, the parity Ethereum used to determine uh, whether it uh, should should update itself. So it, mm. it, it's like there was a concept of the Yellow Paper Council. There was a concept of voting for an upgrade, and then the uh, uh, parity Ethereum would sort of look out for new upgrades and then download the new thing and automatically restart itself with a new upgraded um, version of itself uh, when it uh, uh, when it was meant to. So it was a sort of an early, uh, an early version of forkless upgrades. Cool. Um, How was this uh, received by the wider Ethereum community, especially those who generally held authority over decisions? I think there were there were elements that 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 welcomed the tractability of decision making. Um, I think, as with any political system, those individuals that stand to lose influence. Or that stand to have their ignorant, uh, their 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 power reduced, mm-hmm. will necessarily be against any alteration to the power structures to the polity. Mm. 
Uh, it's just a, a natural part of uh, of humanity. Right? Tolkien covered this in Lord of the Rings. It's like you know, I might I might want to use the ring to do good, but in reality, once I have that power, I my my main concern will be not losing that power. That's right. I think we see this everywhere, and it's a gr- it's like a. Um, it's just a very, a not very human thing or a, a, a superhuman thing to be able to give up power, hmm. to be able to see power for the, um, you know, the, the, the ball and chain that it is. Wow. And I think, I think people do, but they, I think oftentimes they're not the people that end up in power. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> right maybe you, you can't have that gene if you do end up in power or something like that. A system of governance that, not only provides power to those who merit the power, to those who merit, who will make good decisions, yeah. but also to those who will not utilize the power to retain power. Yeah, right. Is uh, is 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 crucial, and probably, probably, a system is only resilient in the long term if it guarantees the second thing even more potently than it guarantees the first thing, which is to say one should prefer those who will not attempt to retain power at all costs Hmm. over those who merit, those who are likely to make the best decisions. Oftentimes, these two will be uh, uh, competing. Like, an individual will deliver the first, but also may risk the second. Mm -hmm. And, And a system that ensures that they never attempt to retain power um, is probably it's probably more important to ensure that that second point that that anyone in control doesn't attempt to retain control more than the first point at a certain point in ethereum it became too constrained it didn't it seemed like we weren't going to be upgrading we were going to be evolving we just had phil on the show last week he told the saga of eip 999 this whole thing You started to develop Polkadot, we're going to skip ahead a little bit, and you wound up with what you called Governance One, which was this council model. Uh, people were able to elect a council, not one person, one vote, but based on the amount of DOT they held or KSM they held. How do you think Governance One went? And was it designed to be the ultimate solution, or was it always meant to be a step? No, it was a stopgap solution. Mm-hmm. And I, I think... Uh, I seem to remember speaking in China when I introduced Governance One, pointing this out very clearly. This is uh, this is the first iteration. Um, it will get us past launch. It yeah. will not be the final solution. Uh-huh. The idea was that in the early days, we may need to do, we may need to take emergency actions. We may need to fix bugs. We may need to re, you know, re, revert or restart. Or as such, we need a, a more coherent. Um, model for decision making yeah. and that's where the council came from there was also the technical committee so it was actually a, a, a sort of tricameral structure so we had the technical committee which was originally meant to be lots of uh, different implementer teams um, and research teams in reality it, it, it sort of ended up being just the Web3 Foundation and Parity then there was the uh, uh, the council, which was a voted, uh, something uh, used, uh, a fragment voting algorithm. Mm-hmm. In some sense, it was a, a, a an approval vote system, so you could approve of several people. Right. And, and it would use your vote to ensure that um, as many of those people got a seat on the council as possible. I think the council was originally 13 members. Sounds 11. right. Mm-hmm. 11 or 13. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the Kusama Council went up to 19 or so. Yeah. And the council could make a proposal that could be fast-tracked. I think the council had its own ability to uh, uh, to put to put forward a proposal. Yeah, they were called the motions, right? Motions, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then uh, separately there was the main um, sort of referendum um, room, mm-hmm. which would uh, uh, be needed to... Uh, get a vote through, and then votes. Ah, yes, that's right. The council could alter what the what the counting mechanism was that's for right. these three different things, right? Yeah, we had one once that the council put to voters at a 50-50 yeah. because it was, like, controversial. So they're like, okay, well, everybody go figure it out. Yeah, yeah. so it's like majority carries or positive uh, turnout bias or yep. negative turnout bias, right? Yeah, yeah as I said, I, I think it delivered some of what we uh, what we needed um well 
uh, the thing it would definitely didn't deliver was a decentralization. Yeah. It was not long-term going to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing, you know, um, regulation continuing to up its game, continuing to <laughs> um, sort of identify uh, systems that have relatively few actors in, much like the council, um, and, uh, uh, and try to break them apart into their individuals and then... Who has authority and go after them, right? Go after them. Yeah. And this is, this is problematic mm -hmm. for a decentralized system. I think the only uh, real way of being sort of... Um, the only proven decentralized model is Bitcoins, right? Mm. Uh, or at least the only proven sort of properly economic decentralized model is Bitcoins, um, which is basically where individuals are not readily identifiable because it's like I don't know, IP addresses or cryptographic keys. And secondly, so actually not IP addresses, where there are nodes on a network. Now, you might run enough of the network to maybe be able to identify a node for where a block came from, but mm. it, it, one can hide one's IP address in the Bitcoin network fairly effectively. Um, and as I say, cryptographic keys, which are pseudonymous perhaps, but still not um, readily, uh, don't allow you to readily identify an individual. And this is how Bitcoin... Um, rewards its validators and indeed how you know validators in bitcoin kind of identify themselves and i think it's it's a model that works it's a model that has not been shut down has stood this relatively strong test of time 15 years mm -hmm. we don't have in some sense therefore open gov the next generation governance was what this was based on governance one um was much more based on saying, well, we're in the early stage of launching a network. Mm -hmm. Let's ensure that we can fix it if it breaks. And so these were the two sort of divergent things that were drawing us um, in different directions. Relatively smooth transition to OpenGov. Mm -hmm. We tried it out on Kusama for, I think, seven months, drained a fair bit of the treasury, but otherwise uh, pretty good. Now it's running quite happily on Polkadot. Is there anything you would change about the initial parameters at this point? Yeah, I, I definitely think some of the parameters need to be tweaked. I think there's already an RFC that I've put my thoughts regarding. What are the main points on, on that? Certainly reducing some of the decision times on Kusama, changing a few of the curves, mm -hmm. uh, changing some of the deposits. To be more accessible or, or harder? More accessible for most of them. Okay, yeah. Um, harder for uh, some more accessible, some harder. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, the the bigger spends, uh, the idea was to make it um, longer. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller spends, easier. Mm -hmm. I think for Kusama, really uh, shortening that decision period is a good plan. Cool. Um, try and get things uh, much more um, sort of reactive and uh, adaptive. I think the biggest uh, alteration needed and this is something that is being worked on, is just moving away from the central treasury model. So the central treasury needs to exist. Where do you put the, 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 the funds? Mm -hmm. um, but it should be moved out in larger chunks to a more delegative model for individuals that are happy to be delegated to, and for obviously the community is happy to be delegated um, towards, in a manner a little bit reminiscent of Gov1. Which is yeah, the, right. where, the, where the, the, the council controlled the treasury. Mm -hmm. um, so I can well imagine that we might have quite a few such councils controlling a number of different treasuries, a little bit similar to the fellowship. One yeah. can imagine a fellowship treasury, or one can also imagine like a marketing fellowship, which has its own treasury. Sure, or, sure. Having multiple treasuries to handle these various different areas of the uh, areas of funding. Mm -hmm is really what we need to strive towards now. So we have, uh, so that we're not constantly asking the wider ecosystem to fund, you know, 3K here and 8K there <laughs> and 50K. And then as soon as someone says, well, you know, I want to, I want 5 million. It's like, well, th that will never go through, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, they, they will then argue, well, we want a degree of certainty that we will get funded over the next three years. And sure. it's like, okay, so there has, something has to give here. And I think the thing that has to give is, well, if you have a, if you have a longer-lived fellowship membership, like, um, I don't know, a, say a, a, a wallet fellowship that, that funds wallets, Nova, Subwallet. Talisman. Talisman. Um, we can imagine there would be a greater level of faith 
that a team that sort of is building a 18 month, two, three year project would have a greater deal of faith that they will get funding for the project's duration. Yeah. Um, when it is a constrained group of people that are making that decision rather than any old token holder that, that, that sort of might want to come in and have their vote be heard with arbitrary amount of conviction. Or just their voice, even if <laughs> sometimes they don't even have a vote, right? Yeah. It's a little bit hardcore right now, for sure. Um, we see people ground down yeah. to maybe um, the worst of themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. It can be a bit intense, but also uh, good for burning off uh, the things that are useless, the people that are just here to take money. Yeah, I, I definitely, I think there's a... I mean, it's probably like, you know, 20%, 60%, 20%, right? So there's like a 20% hardcore that are never going. Yeah. There's a 20% um, that are just opportunistic, that are just here as long as the good times roll. Yeah, and then yeah. there's kind of 60% in the middle that you kind of, you don't, yeah, it's a bit of both. You know, they're kind of into it, but they kind of also do need, they, they do want to make a bit of money. They want to, you know, they want to be comfortable. Yeah, and it's yeah. like... It's how deep into the first twenty percent you know, you cut loose and that that's fine, and then it's like how deep into the next sixty percent that mm -hmm. you're gonna cut, um, and I think you know it's it's not gonna uh, be a maybe a big issue if you if you cut into some of this, but you definitely you know you want to retain um, it, it's it's that sixty percent that some of the sort of crazy ideas that no one really thinks could be that good end up coming from and mm. being developed by. Yeah. Like the 20% that are, that are going to be there forever, like yeah. they're a relatively small uh, group of people. Um, and they are, you know, they're dedicated to the underlying mission, but they're not necessarily, they don't number very many and they're not necessarily going to be thinking too hard outside of this relatively focused um, um, sort of mission. Sure. Nonetheless, um, I, I take, I do believe that there's, uh, there's an element in this entire industry that is here really not believing in the, in the, in the underlying goal of like, you know, self-sovereignty, decentralization and so forth, but really just here to, uh, make a bit of, uh, uh crypto, uh, yeah, cash. yeah, you can sense it off them. Transitioning to a model where the treasuries split up, and maybe we have more of a council taking care of these different treasuries. Do you worry at all that that again opens us up to the attack vector from governments and nations that want to pick polka dot apart? It's a trade off. Hmm. There is no perfect design. That's right. So it's it's necessarily has an element of this. Now the question is. To what degree are you uh, resilient, right? If your entire governance system works around, you know, whatever, 13 people not being uh, 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 intimidated or you know, <laughs> coerced in some way, hmm. uh, it's not very resilient. Like your entire government system is, is probably broken. Um, but if you have, let's say... Um, five different fellowships each or maybe 10 each with i don't know between 25 and 100 people in um and controlling um uh each i don't know one at most one one tenth of the annual budget then it's like okay maybe they maybe they you know go after 20 people in one of the smaller fellowships and they take um, a twelfth of the annual budget. But you haven't lost that much, right? Yeah, yeah. Or they freeze it or something. Uh -huh. And then it's like, okay, now we understand. Now we know where the uh, where the threshold is and we have to be a little bit more careful, right? Sure, we have to sure. be more decentralized. We have to be... And uh, But the, the point is that, is that we, have, we say it's like graceful degradation, right? Hmm. As the system's resilience gets called into question, um, as the system's functionality gets degraded, um, it happens gracefully. It happens a little bit at a time, which yeah, means right. we can adapt. Mm -hmm. Whereas if your entire system uh, is based on, is found foundationally based on 13 people, yeah. and if they get if they get screwed, or if, even worse, if a majority of them get, get sort of uh, intimidated or coerced or whatever, then... Uh, you, you, and the, then the entire system goes down and you can't fix it. It doesn't gracefully degrade. It, yeah, it, yeah. it, it like, uh, it ungracefully degrades. It, it's <laughs> catastrophic. Mm. Um, so the main thing I think is that we, we're at the, at the end of the day, it's, 
sort of cutting edge stuff. We we can't afford not to sail quite close to the wind, so we have to sail close to the wind. But we do so in a way that if um, if the ship topples, it, it doesn't sink everybody. Yeah, right. I wanted to ask you about this concept of democracy because I've heard leaders in the ecosystem say, ah, yes, open gov is a great democracy. And I've also believe I've heard you say open gov was never intended to be a democracy. Now, I think the term is a little bit ambiguous. One of these terms we take for granted. Can you help define what you see as democracy and speak to the role it plays in open gov? Yeah, so this is some, this is a conversation I had many many years ago with uh, with Aaron about what a democracy is. Yeah, there's a good quote from Peep Show. Uh, it's a great comedy on on in the UK. I can heartily recommend everybody uh, watch it. Um, I think the quote is, "Can't I just have everything I want all of the time? Isn't that what a democracy is?" <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you can if you want to like a. Like the idealized democracy, there's the Athenian democracy, right? So this is the original, this is where the word comes from, mm -hmm. rule by the people. Of, and in this case, it was a particular city, and it was uh, in ancient Greece. And it's, you know, the people that could vote were like, not the slaves, not the women. <laughs> right. The guys of a certain age. Like, <laughs> uh, Ruled by these people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a broad enough group. It was like, mm. you know, in the tens of thousands that it, 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 well, in the thousands anyway, uh, that it made sense uh, to give it a, a name different to um, all of the other things that are basically dictatorships, monarchies, imperial, mm -hmm. aristocracies, and so forth. It's used, saying X is a democracy is pretty meaningless these days, mm. unless we specifically want to refer to an Athenian democracy, like one person, one vote. Um, and even then, it's questionable what if that translates into the modern day, where you know we have uh, we, we do broadly expect to have um, uh, everybody's vote be counted equally, hmm. everybody to be able to have a vote. Maybe not three year olds, but like maybe yeah. maybe three year olds should be given a vote. I don't know. <laughs> um, instead, what we can talk about is uh, demo democratic a system being democratic, and it might be more or less democratic. Mm. So we can imagine a system that has proportional representation, that has universal suffrage, that has um, uh, high turnout numbers, um, maybe even pays for, for people to turn out. Um, this might might be a more democratic system to like a system where it's like there's only two parties and it doesn't matter which party you vote for in almost all of the areas, uh, almost all uh, regions that you live. Hmm. This might be considered a less democratic system. Uh, it's still not like not a democracy or something, but like it's not very democratic. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, Democratic democracy, rule of the people. So it's like, is the, is the rule in the hands of the people? I guess that's like a good um, rule of thumb to determine whether a system is democratic. It's mm -hmm. like, are there interests here that could be said to be, to influence an outcome greater than people, the people? Um, but this is like a whole... Uh, avenue of political philosophy that you know I know too little about to really um, uh, uh, give a, a considered opinion on. Um, the only thing I would say is that there isn't a particularly well-received uh, understanding of the word democracy, mm -hmm. and and the best I could do with democratic is saying a system is more democratic if any given individual has approximately the same uh, level of influence of the system over any other individual. Sure. That doesn't really, uh, uh, that's a fairly theoretical, like abstract definition, and yeah. it's not not so easy to um, um, to reason. I mean, it's not trivial to reason how democratic any given system is. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to analyze how much in influence any given individual has. And the, the interesting point I'd note here is that it's not about voting systems. Voting systems play a large part, uh, but it's not merely about voting systems. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, one can conceive a democratic system, one can actually conceive of a perfectly democratic system that has no voting system. 
uh, this would be the um, dictator for a day uh, with a perfectly random selection over which citizen is the dictator for any given day. Okay. Right? And All this right. is perfectly democratic by my, hmm. by, by my um, uh, definition. Sure. Because everybody um, has, the, has the same level of influence over the system as anybody else. Everyone has the same chance of becoming uh, the dictator. And, you know, we could just say, well, one person is dictator for, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 years. But, uh, and we choose that person randomly. And technically, until we choose that person, as long as it is a random selection, mm -hmm. then um, it is also a perfect democracy. Because everybody has the same chance of influencing. Uh, okay, so it's about chances, not about... Well, I mean, uh, there is no other way of mathematically reasoning other than... Uh, other than through probability in this case, because it's a probabilistic outcome. Mm -hmm. It's like who will be the dictator? Well, who will who will have um, influence over any given decision? Well, it's randomly determined. Um, okay, what are the chances? Well, I have exactly if I'm I don't know in the system with a million other people, I have exactly one millionth of a chance. Which, by the definition of a perfectly democratic system, means that I have exactly the same level of influence as everybody else. Right. Because right. it's exactly the same millionth of a chance of being the one who decides something. Right. Well, you know, this is all very ideological. And in the end, ideology doesn't always translate into progress and efficiency in the real world. In the last couple weeks and months, there's been, I would say, a growing saltiness by maybe holders that feel like they don't have a lot of influence, mm. um, you know, shaking their fist at the lack of democracy, things like this. Yeah. But at the same time, um, we have a unique system here where those with the most to lose have generally the most say in what we do. Mm. Do you pay attention to the landscape of governance? Are you, are you watching closely? Uh, not closely. I'm okay. watching... Not so closely. <laughs> okay. Well, let me lay it, out and lay it out to our viewers as well. We're talking at the beginning of November 2023. Mm. And on Polkadot, I would say there are four obvious groups, voting groups. We have this 16DG character who swings around 30 million voting power. Recently, they're actually doing a lot of um, transparent work in niches of the community to organize, to create systems and create competition. That's interesting. We have this uh, Chaos DAO, mm. where it's a reputation system. You get in based on reputation, then it's one person, one vote mm. to dictate a stack. Yeah. Uh, IV is quite powerful. This seems to be sort of one person, one vote, but you have to delegate. And if you delegate more, you actually get the say, but you'll listen to everybody mm. kind of system. And then finally, there's like, I don't know, there's these bags that come out for system upgrades and otherwise they're pretty quiet, but mm. what do you think about these, like, they're kind of like sub-governance systems forming? I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and the fact that this uh, has arisen, I would say, is an indication that OpenGov is doing its job in yeah. facilitating new systems, new mechanisms. Yeah. Um, it's always a good sign if, I mean, it's a good sign of the of the underlying design of a system if you end up with emergent effects that get utilized, that people find are useful, um, that you did not originally predict would happen. I've floated around a few um, votes. Um, I don't generally cast my opinion because I fear that that would be a little too, hmm. um, it could prejudice things too much no doubt but uh, you know i have my opinion on a lot of things and occasionally I'm, i might um put 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 some put my bag my bag to uh, <laughs> nice uh, to use Good. do you mind sharing any that you put your bag to again i don't i don't want to go into too many uh, well, too much um uh, uh, uh name name too many names i do think I, I'll, I'll i will go into my general thoughts mm -hmm. though i don't think that it's sensible to pretend that the treasury is a vc fund and i noticed that there are uh, there are there is a sentiment within the community that, that that is seeking to compare the treasury as a funding source with vcs mm. and in particular on the similar terms to what a vc would fund except for the fact of except for the part of ownership uh -huh. i don't think this is a sensible comparison to make mm. for for a couple of reasons one of them is due diligence vcs mm. do a lot of due diligence 
and there are people whose reputations are on the line if um, a VC that are not the recipients of funding, if a VC does badly um, on a large outlay. Um, secondly, VCs are protected in uh, by law um, from um, funds being misspent. Hmm. This puts a an impetus on fiduciary responsibility um, on the recipient of funding that just isn't there with treasury funding. Thirdly, VCs tend to uh, not provide, or, although they might sign up for providing a certain chunk of funding, um, they will typically not provide all of the money mm -hmm. up front. Mm -hmm. And there are legal means by which a VC can seek to exit from a contract. That, again, tends not to be what is proposed with regards to the Treasury. Mm. In part because um, those who are receiving the funding want to ensure that uh, they have... Uh, they receive the fiat that they're expecting, not necessarily the, 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 the crypto that they're expecting. That's right. I think that the legal situation is, is for me, one of the most crucial and one of the most underrepresented. Um, and it's why treasury funding should ha must happen in relatively small chunks for the final outlay, but could, in principle, be managed in much larger chunks when it's given to a, a broader, more um, less highly aligned um, group of delegates like mm. a fellowship. Mm. So it's not that I don't, I don't, it's not that I don't see an answer to teams that are seeking this kind of funding, but I don't think they should be seeking it from the treasury. And so when I see, you know, a large uh, uh, a proposal of funding with mm. basically zero safeguards that it will be spent um, um, on, what we expect it to be spent on. Um, when I see zero safeguards, that it won't be uh, that what what is being what what is built might uh, ultimately be repurposed for something outside of Polkadot. Uh, when I see zero safeguards, that um, what is being built might be ultimately combined with some for-profit fund mechanism um, that would allow them to uh, disproportionately benefit from it. Yeah. Um, all of this stuff that would be naturally just impossible to do as a VC mm -hmm. uh, under VC funding. I mean, even under the under company law, leaving apart VC funding for now, as a as as um, an investor in a company, you, there are all sorts of avenues that you can go down to prevent a, a team from basically doing anything but helping make you richer. Hmm. If, you, for example, you want to, you decide that. Um, You've come to a realization uh, that actually this product isn't the thing that the market needs. It's this product. Yeah, yeah. So what you want to do is start afresh and you just wind down the company, make a new company with all the same people. Yeah, yeah. And do make that product instead. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually illegal. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. if you do that, yeah. at least in, in jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, like the UK, you can get sued by those initial investors. Sure, yeah. Because basically what, what you've done is... That investor didn't invest in, you know, the product that you said that you said you were, you were going to make. They didn't even invest in the company's mission. What they invested in was that team. Yeah. And they can argue that to a court and say, mm. well, what, what you've done is you've done me out of my investment because you've spent the money, um, you've, uh, you know, done your thing, and now you've now you've wound this down, but you've kind of taken this. IP, this under this comprehension, this team, mm -hmm. this underlying um, asset that has been built in the company yeah, of yeah. these people and these relationships, and, paid for and you've and, and therefore been paid for by the investor, and <laughs> you've moved it elsewhere to this other thing right, right. that I no longer that I don't have any ownership of. Yeah. Right. And whereas, in fact, what they will argue is what you should do is you should try and uh, create more shares and sell those shares. Right. I've, I'm in some sense. You're now married to me. You're not allowed to go to just divorce me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put money into this marriage. I mm -hmm. expect my pound of flesh out, yeah. and and so in 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 some sense, you uh, you as a as as an investor, you as a shareholder, um, are uh, receive quite a substantial degree of protection that just doesn't exist. Um, there isn't really an equivalent that exists in the treasury until we have all encompassing means by which people can say, "I agree to this." this set of rules in perpetuity. 
It's like whatever sort of agreement I enter into here, like some transaction, maybe tokens, token exchange or, or whatever. Yeah. I agree to be bound by these broader rules, um, like the, the laws of society, at some bigger, um, broader pain of, of sufferance if I break them. Hmm. What do we need for this? Well, you can say, right, well, we, we, we can just say uh, steak, right? You put in 10 grand of steak and... And, and that's it. And then it's like you lose this 10 grand of stake if you then, I don't know, launch another token a year after you've just done this token, right? Yeah. You know, by with the, in the same team or whatever. Like we can imagine these like longer term um, rules that you can stake to, to, to say I will live by them. But it doesn't really mm. work because A, most of the people can't afford 10K just to put up in stake. And mm. B, mm. It, it would basically limit them, limit the amount that you would expect them to raise to about 20k because they would otherwise just use half of them as a cost for paying off the stake right, that they right. already intend to, to break um so actually what you need is civil resistance that's actually what something that, that, that the legal system and society provides us with right yes. if you have civil resistance then you don't need the state because you just say right everyone is given a basic level of of social credit right? We have a reputation. We trust that you aren't going to do this bad thing. And it's like, as long as, as long as you haven't done this bad thing, one of these bigger, longer term social rules, then your social credit remains intact. But as soon as you do something that's bad, like for example, uh, do some of the startup, like, you know, use up the, use up the funding that you get, uh, declare bankruptcy, and then <laughs> start this new startup uh, using more more uh, funding, yeah. then you lose your social credit. Right. And if you lose your social credit, you're much less likely to be able to get funding because people know that you've already done this thing before. So you need some degree of, 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 um, of that yeah, ultra long-term reputation system, social credit system, basically civil resistance. Now, are you talking about like... Um credit as far as funding goes, funding credit, or are you speaking more of like a social credit like Kind of reputation system, but reputation mm. system that's managed on chain. Yeah. And more crucially, yeah. um, civil, uh, a civil resistance system by which it's um, the ability for... Um, so suppose you want to launch a new project. It would be useful to be able to not have to give away your meat space identity but yet still be able to say, I have never let investors down previously. Hmm. Basically, what we, what, when an investor put, buys into, as VCs typically do, a team, it's crucial that there is some understanding that the team, that this investment sits with the team, not the project. This is really hmm. what is being sold in many respects to, to, to investors. Hmm. And if... If a product is uh, is determined to be not a great fit, but some other product like it is, and the same team wants to build it, then there needs to be some uh, understanding and some uh, uh, enforcement that um, that that investment should still carry carry over in some form to this new uh, product, new proposition, even because it's the same team. So you're hopeful that it's going to be possible to, I mean, not only solve identifying individual humans, but also prevent, let's say, bad actors with a lot of money from just buying, you know, the persona of, of people in other parts of the world. Think so this I, don't, is solvable? I, I don't think that um, inevitably people can sell individuality for a fee. Mm -hmm. I see this essentially as being a a requirement to delivering something that is comparable to what we have in society at the moment. I don't see it as being sufficient. Hmm. If you're going to raise a lot of cash, then it's not enough just to say, hey, I'm an, I'm an, I am an individual. Um, however, if you're going to raise a lot of cash on the basis that they're buying into you, then it's important that this is codified in some way. Mm. Because otherwise, an algorithmic investor like the Treasury cannot possibly um, uphold that. If an algorithmic investor like the Treasury 
is to work, it must be able to identify individuals and identify the same individual when they uh, come back later for more funding or for, for funding under a different guise. Hmm. Now, an algorithmic investor like the Treasury probably also, for large outlays, would want to identify the individual as well, KYC, yeah. right? Yeah. Hey, this is why the Treasury should hand me some funding. It's not enough for you to say, I am a person. That's not enough. You need to be able to say, I am a person that can reasonably deliver this. Um, but there needs to be some way of linking... Uh, Firstly, there needs to be a way of, of, of ensuring that in that first rung, um, the very first $100 or $10 funding from the Treasury, um, that that is not something that can be just done time and time again by the same person. So, no, I don't think it's enough to have civil resistance, but I do think it's a um, it opens up a lot of corridors that, is, that are just not possible if we rely purely on... Um, economic incentives, um, or indeed economic disincentives. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I think it can help with is things that are uh, in decentralizing systems, de in terms of hu humanly decentralizing systems, not running them on many computers, but running them under many eyes. You know, it. I love this tension between this stark record of truth on the blockchain and this amorphous social layer on the other side. It's all about transparency over here. Over here, we have secrets, right? We have this dark gov versus light gov. Do you think secrets play a role in governance? Or do you think governance works better in the light? I think we have to understand what our uh, aim is with governance, because there are two competing aims that I've seen. One of them is inclusion. And the other is the degree to which it benefits individuals. So governance, you can look at governance as inputs and outputs, right? Mm. Inputs might be what people say, how people act, what people vote, do, um, um, how their opinions get counted. And the outputs are what the collective does on this, on this basis, like what the collective does money is spent by the treasury, what upgrades go through, what um, fellowships form, who is ranked by, by uh, uh, who, is, who is not ranked, who, what events happen, and so forth, right? I've seen voices out there that say it's the point of governance is not about delivering good decisions. The point of governance is about ensuring legitimacy. Right? Love of whatever decisions come out. Interesting. And if if it's better to have a bad decision come out legitimate with clear legitimacy than a good decision without clear legitimacy. Okay. Hmm. What do you uh, think about that? I think it's bullshit. Okay. Um, but I, I accept that it is a viewpoint. <laughs> okay. I, I do believe legitimacy um, is a, a virtue of a governance system. Not... Not per se, not because it's not, not purely in and of itself, um, but rather because it retains the faith of the mem of the people within the collective. And mm. um, a collective is nothing if it has no members. So mm. then we have to look, why do members stay in a collective? Well, they stay in it for two reasons. One, economic benefit. Mm -hmm. right? um, but economic benefit is a very short term, it can be a very fickle thing. And if people don't see uh, economic benefit for a period of time, not everyone is very long-term focused. Mm. They may move to an alternate collective. They may get disenfranchised. No, no I'm, this is enough. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm done. I'm going elsewhere. Yeah. I could find the grass is greener over there. Yeah. It's just new, right? So it's, I think it's questionable to rely purely on um, economic incentive unless one is confident one can co uh, consistently deliver it on the time scale that, that its, its desired members expect. Hmm. The second thing that, that people look towards within the collective is, hmm. I identify with this collective. Well, how would someone identify with a collective? Well, uh, they feel that they are being fairly represented. Hmm. They feel that decisions made by the collective are legitimate. 
they look for um, perhaps one might argue I mean I don't necessarily want to argue this but um, they might look for the legitimacy within the collective or rather a collective that appears illegitimate probably would um, they would not identify with hmm People want to operate under fair rules, even if it doesn't benefit them. At least. Mm -hmm. I th I'd say this is a... I'd say that as long as it benefits them, and as long as you have a rational actor, they don't care about legitimacy. But in mm -hmm. the case that it doesn't benefit them, mm -hmm. then maybe if it also doesn't appear legitimate, uh -huh, okay. then maybe they're not so... They're not, they're not going to stick around. Yeah. I would say that legitimacy... Um, is a consideration, but I wouldn't say it's the primary consideration. I would, say, mm. I would still say that the primary consideration is making good decisions. Hmm. And if a system can make good, if a governance system can make good decisions, then um, it need not necessarily be, it need not necessarily um, be the paragon of um, legitimacy. I, I, I guess this is a very particular. Um, way that I'm using legitimacy here, because legitimacy is different. is is essentially fulfilling the expectations of the members according to uh, how how it operates and how it makes decisions. Mm. And obviously, different members can have different expectations, and some will feel that the thing is operating illegitimately, even though it's actually perfectly following its rules. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult. Um, um, uh, a concept to uh, to really nail down. We had a very interesting situation happen on Kusama these past few weeks where very opaque voting bloc, um, some refer to them as the chaotic entity, they hold something like 320, 350,000 worth of voting power. Right. They, um, and they, they appear to just vote whatever opposite the, the rest vote. So they're kind of like this gesture or something like that, you could say. Contrarian. Recently, they very nearly um, funded an ecosystem agent whose intention was to take those funds and put down the decision deposit to wipe the treasury to zero. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, do you think of, what do you think about that? What do you think about the state of chaos on Kusama and governance? Um, does it still occupy your mind? Or Kusama was launched to help test the things that Polkadot would use that could not be tested on a test net due to the lack of economic incentivization. Yeah, yeah. And I think in that respect, it has done its job very well and it continues to be um, an interesting um, uh, weather vane for what may be arising on Polkadot. I think the fact that there are people within the Kusama community that are concerned about price, uh, a, a token uh, value and so forth um, and indeed the treasury spending and this this is a good uh, I don't necessarily agree with them but mm -hmm. I think it's good that Kusama brings it out because it's helpful to understand the, the, the social circumstances the socioeconomic circumstances in which Polkadot operates it's another point on the map mm. and it's important to have as many data points as possible right Honestly, in my opinion, the treasury is there for, for, for spending. Mm -hmm. Markets are, are funny things, and they operate in funny ways. And um, there may be, you know, I've read some of the arguments about why maybe you don't want to see the treasury funds handed out mm. um, to teams that would uh, primarily have fiat um, uh, expenses. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, I, I get it. But... Um, in my mind, Kosama maybe hasn't done its job quite so effectively, or the Kosama Treasury maybe hasn't done its job quite so effectively as as I would have would have wanted. In that, it has retained the funds and not spent. Like the idea mm -hmm. was with the Treasury funds, at mm -hmm. least when I sort of wrote the code, was that it would be, you know, they'd be spent more or less as they came in. Yeah, like, yeah, right. Uh, maybe there'd be a float, but not a huge, it wouldn't run a huge surplus. Mm -hmm. And if it did run a surplus, the surplus would be primarily there to be utilized as a sort of sovereign wealth fund, maybe buying other tokens, putting it into decentralized exchanges, um, uh, loans to teams, I don't know. But like, um, as it stands, it's just like, a, we've kind of, uh, we've moved in some sort of almost slept-walked into uh, fiscal conservatism 
Yeah. Where it's like, oh, no, if the funds are in the treasury, that means they should never be spent. <laughs> right. And it's like, well, that really wasn't the intention. Hmm. Um, I don't think it's a terrible thing to have a big treasury. It's like, wow, we've got a, such a big treasury. We can fund so many cool stuff. Sure. But, but the intention, like, it should be well understood that it's the treasury. It's there for paying for stuff. And it's like... The, the less it's the, the the more it's not deployed, the more harm it does. It's like the worst kind of deployment is burning it. I would argue because it's like it, it will probably have very little effect on Kosama. <laughs> um, it will have no immediate effect. I, I I find it hard to imagine it would have a very immediate effect on uh, benefit benefiting individuals within Kosama. <laughs> I would say it's really just the knee jerk reaction. <laughs> But I would still argue, okay, at least it's deploying it, right? <laughs> at least, at least we're doing something with it, even if it is burning. Now, why would I say? Why do I think burning is maybe better than just leaving it in the treasury ad infinitum? Well, because it uh, it reduces the uh, it makes it clear. I suppose it makes a clear economic argument that funds in the treasury need not uh, do not contribute to. Uh, the supply side, and therefore anyone who is attempting to analyze the market mm -hmm. um, can uh, perhaps argue that um, it is less inflationary than than they would otherwise presuppose. Right? Okay, we're if trying there's... to do something greater than that, though, aren't we? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so it's like I, I think it's. If it's if it's an argument over the funds stay in the treasury forever, yeah. <laughs> or the funds get burnt, and we just say, yeah, actually, there's not as much inflation, uh -huh. in pra pra practically speaking, uh, or even theoretically speaking, um, then okay, if that's the choice, if it's one or the other, then uh -huh. all right, yeah, I'll take the hmm. the second option, I suppose, but. That isn't the choice, right? Yeah. We can deploy it in other ways. And it's like, we should be deploying it in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I read into this is that we need better ways of deploying funds, like mm -hmm. better mechanisms by which funds can be deployed, I should say. Better governance in some sense. Which, I, and again, back to the sort of splitting things out, having multiple fellowships, having, you know, um, uh, uh, people that have, you know, collectives that have um, remits, to be able to fund um, under a certain uh, a certain class of things that might need funding, one could imagine even a, a sort of sovereign wealth fellowship, mm -hmm. right? That's, that, that gets given a bunch of the the treasury uh, to just go on decentralized exchanges and buy uh, you know score other tokens, sure, and, and, yeah. and retain you know. Uh, or score other assets and retain, uh, make a Kusama sovereign wealth fund. Hey, speaking of that, there, there was talk early on about, and I, it might have even been justification for giving Kusama value, but it was this idea of taking DOT tokens and mm -hmm. bringing it into Kusama. Is that, do you think that's still on the cards or do you think it's certainly, <laughs> it's certainly on yeah, the cards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where once does the, that DOT come from? The once the bridge treasury? gets built, um, I think it comes, I mean, we'll have to. Uh, figure that out, but I th yeah. uh, the the original idea was that it came from the Web three Foundation. Okay, so we have to like look into you know we got to ask the Web three Foundation kind of <laughs> how do we structure this? Um, but yes, that that was the original uh, idea, and certainly Kosama should have. I think actually the original the original proposition was that this one percent of dot this like a million million dot million old dot hundred yeah. million. Is that right? No. 100,000 old dot, yes. Okay. 100,000 dot, old dot, one, uh, 10 million new dot um, would be there uh, to uh, 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 to incentivize participation within Kusama. And I think the very the basic level of that would just be um, hand it to the Kusama treasury. Okay, well, that'll be wild. That I hear the bridge is coming. Nice. The bridge is indeed on its way. <laughs> nice. So, like, I think that there's... Uh, I, de I definitely am one to... That, that believes that a DAO should have should be run, uh, you know, uh, with uh, you know f uh, with fiscal responsibility, with financial responsibility, and part of that is uh, minimizing this uh, um, very volatile nature of, of crypto by mm. um, um, doing what any rational 
um, organization or individual would do with their assets, which is you know, diversifying to some degree. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there is, a, you know, I don't know if anyone's making this argument, but, you know, an argument, a bunk argument would be, well, you know, this is Polkadot, you know, why would Polkadot want to hold anything other than dot tokens? Because it believes in itself, right? It's like nonsense. It's like, of course, po like Polkadot, if Polkadot is being reasonable, yeah, yeah. Then of course it would want to hold. It doesn't live in a vacuum, right? Course, it yes. lives in, a, in an industry and wider. It lives in the wider world. Yeah. Of course it would want to hold other assets. It might want to hold gold. It might want to hold a basket of, of real fiat currencies. It might want to hold other cryptocurrencies. It might want to hold NFTs. It might want to hold um, oil or other commodities. It know, land. It, uh, land. It could <laughs> want to hold, I don't know, buildings or companies, right? Of course it wants to hold yes, yes. Uh, lots of uh, diverse things in order to. Uh, because it's a, if it wants to build a well-functioning, long-lived organization, it needs to protect itself against um, volatility. I think what was getting there with, uh, and the fellowship is a notable uh, trendsetter here. I think in that it's it's attempting as a decentralized entity to score um, tokens that are not native to its platform. Yeah, um, and this will help. Um, uh, manage volatility. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see how that. How that how that goes, but I think this is the sort of thing that I th I think just has has to happen. I've I've talked about it a bit, you know, you know, in the old days, 2017, 18, 19. So I'm kind of excited to get this get this in and see how it works. I think it particularly makes sense with uh, polka dots and, and Kusama's treasuries, given that a we want we, we are funding things that are paid out in fiat. Yeah. Therefore just makes so much sense to have that fiat up front and manage it like a, a real asset. Mm -hmm. Question is how to manage it, of course. And if you do it like too openly, then the market, you know, end up with like market um, people front running and, and all, all the rest of it. So yeah, yeah, uh, right. Probably has to be some uh, some clever way of, of uh, uh, managing this long term when it's, we're talking about a large amount of capital. But in the, in the short term, I think it's easy enough just to use hydro dx or whatever yeah so cool um gavin i've loved talking to you it's it's been so awesome i think a role that uh, a lot of people don't normally see you in i mean we see you as the architect of polka dot we see you as the leader of a movement a harbinger of of, of new technology that's changing the world but you are you're also a father and one day you're going to leave a world behind to your children and to everybody coming up after you mm -hmm. what do you hope that world looks like? And how do you hope your contributions to this technology contribute to that world? I mean, I would hope that we, that there is a world to start with, <laughs> okay. right? Okay, <laughs> fine. So, uh, you know, <laughs> ideally quite a peaceful one. Yeah. Um, and ideally a, a just one. And I think um, in large part, that's what drives me here. Um, I see uh, power centers as the um, as 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 maybe the even the the underlying source of injustice in the world. Mm. When you where you have arbitrary power, um, injustice seems not far behind, mm. and so creating power systems which is really what blockchains are. They govern large amounts of wealth, large amounts of power that are rules-based and transparent seems to me to be um, a great systematic way of reducing injustice in the world. Um, simply, basically, by limiting arbitrary power. Hmm. The other sort of companion point I suppose, is that there's and maybe something where I feel like I contribute fairly well is is in the, in devising um, the rules for these systems. Like even in even in societies that follow its follow their rules fairly well, if the rules are not well designed, mm. then the societies will not function mm. very well, and they can even. Um, if the rules, like nothing stops rules from being unjust or facilitating injustice. Um, at the end of the day, the rules need to be um, 
need to be simple enough for people to be able to think about them and ideally reason them from first principles um and uh and and uh and to be able to check to make sure that the rules are indeed being followed by um the uh the the sort of parts of the social machinery that are meant to be following the rules the civil servants or the politicians or the machines um that may take over their jobs um and so the the designing of like good rules based systems i think uh, is is going to become a very crucial part of I mean, it's already a crucial part of, of, of civilization, but like, I think it's going to be an even more crucial part of civilization as these systems become more sophisticated. Um, and so, uh, you know, a kind of the drive to like design good rules-based systems uh, is, uh, is, is something that sort of keeps my passion going. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your commitment and your focus. Thank you for sticking around and seeing the, the vision through. Um, I'm sure there's many opportunities for you to just fuck off somewhere, but <laughs> clearly, clearly, you, you know, you're here to, uh, to build something important. Thank you very much for coming on the show as well. We really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Cheers, Jay. Thanks for inviting me back on. It's been a pleasure.